On a grey October morning, we stood on the bridge of the H-28 and waved to our friends who had come to the Parkston dock to wish us luck. We went down the river to the sea and took up position astern of the Admiralty trawler that was to take us out. Its job was to protect the submarine not so much from enemies as from its own ships and planes. A submarine without escort was considered an enemy submarine with all the consequences that followed. And although coastal aviation was always warned about the movement of our submarines, the sight of a lone submarine on the surface could provoke eager pilots to attack, and such cases actually occurred. Visibility was poor, the fresh east wind increased the usual for the North Sea ripples. All day we zigzagged and late at night, we reached the beginning of the secret passage through the mine barrier along the eastern coast. Here the trawler signalled to us, Good hunting! turned back and soon disappeared into the darkness. We were left alone and headed east. At first all went well, and soon we reached the desired area. Here we had to face our first difficulty, determining our own position. We had dived just before dawn near the Dutch coast and had been heading towards it all morning. The sea was calm, the sky was grey and visibility was decent. By noon we finally saw land, and all the afternoon the captain and jock were busy taking bearings through the periscope and trying to establish a correspondence between the white buildings on the featureless shore and the marks on the chart. They finally established our location and began to cruise along the shore for a stretch of about five miles, scrutinising the desolate sea surface. But it wasn't until the third day that something happened that broke the monotony of our underwater duty. Over the next four years, we became accustomed to the routine duties. When a submarine dives, surfacing, or performs an attack manoeuvre, all crew members have a job to do. But during the long hours of waiting, when we are off duty, the crew is divided into three watches. Red, white and blue. Two hours watch, four rests each. Each watch consisted of the necessary number of men to maintain a given depth and provide periscope work. Two horizontal rudder operators sat on the port side in front of the instrument panel and periodically turned the flywheels in front of them. In the forward left corner near the gyro compass was the helmsman. Not far from him was the mechanic responsible for the operation of the instruments controlling the ventilation and purge processes and installed on the starboard panel, as well as for raising and lowering the periscopes. Submariners kept watch not only in the control station, but also in the engine room. In the aft compartment was a torpedo operator who obeyed the commands of the machine telegraph from the control room. In addition, the watch was kept by an acoustician, who could hear the noise of an approaching ship with the help of hydrophones installed on the outside of the hull. And in a tiny cubby hole under the control station, there was a bilge machinist who manipulated the pumps and various valves at the command of the chief mate or watchman. He could fill with water, or on the contrary, blow out any of the tanks on the submarine for diving or surfacing. Now I had to master the tricky science of observing through a periscope. When I first came to the control station to take over the watch from number one, I was bursting with pride, self-importance and curiosity. The first thing he did was to bring me over to the pad table, show me on the map where we were and the ground landmarks I had to determine every half hour. He then showed me what those landmarks looked like through the periscope and made sure I could recognise them. After that, he smiled cheerfully, said, She's all yours, boy, and walked away, leaving me in charge of the ship. Raise the periscope, I muttered, trying to show that I was used to such orders. The first thing I did was to make a cursory circular inspection of the area at low magnification. Having ascertained that there were no enemy ships or planes in the vicinity, I proceeded to scrutinise every quarter of the horizon at high magnification. Occasionally the picture would fade and blur, as a wave would flood the upper lenses, which were only a few inches above the surface of the water. And I continued to stare intently into the distance, trying to make out the top of a mast or the faintest whiff of smoke that might indicate a target was approaching. At the end of the procedure I made another circular survey to make sure that no one had crept up behind use and ordered the periscope to be retracted. A short time later there was another raised periscope, 
then retract periscope, and so on throughout the watch. Looking carefully at the shore covered with a light haze, I could not help but feel the piquancy of the situation. We, the British, live, sleep, eat, communicate with each other, so close to the enemy, but remain invisible to him. At any rate, we hoped that no one would notice us. All the time a periscope observation is being made, care should be taken to keep it no more than a few inches above the water. If the horizontal rudder operators, through inattention or lack of experience, fail to maintain a periscope depth of 30 feet, or if the boat is badly differentiated, it may be possible for the periscope to rise a few feet above the water. It is then not difficult to detect it from shore. This is easily corrected by lowering the periscope a little, but then the observation has to be made bent over, which is not very convenient and rather tiresome. It is better to watch the trim. Based on the above, it seems obvious that, in addition to observing and determining the location of the ship, the officer of the watch must constantly monitor the depth. The senior mate is primarily responsible for the trim. It is he who directs the pumping of the right amount of water into the ballast tanks so that the ship moves horizontally and neutral buoyancy is ensured. People are constantly moving around the ship, the density of water is subject to fluctuations, so during the day there is periodically a need to adjust the trim. This is also the duty of the watch officer. It is clear that an inexperienced person, as I was in those days, it is not easy to guess from the behaviour of the boat that it has trimmed to the stern or bow. If the trim is broken so that the horizontal rudders cannot keep the ship at the desired depth, you can restore controllability by increasing speed, increasing the efficiency of the rudders. But with a large trim violation, increasing speed will not help, and you will have to become the protagonist of an unpleasant and embarrassing spectacle when the boat surfaced in close proximity to the enemy shore. The consequence of this will be the immediate appearance of an angry captain at the control post. The opposite can happen. A submarine that is too heavy will sink and will continue to sink until you are able to regain control. The consequence of all of the above is also the depletion of battery life. So, whatever you do, it's better to keep a constant eye on the trim. Two hours of periscopic observation is not a small amount and requires more effort than it seems at first glance. Especially it is felt in the first time, when with unaccustomed eyes begin to hurt and tear. In addition, work on the periscope requires a lot of attention. Every time you have to repeat to yourself, at this moment, the enemy ship may be approaching the horizon line and will now be within sight. The sooner I spot it, the more time the captain will have to prepare an attack if it is our potential target, or to get away if he is after us. When a period of enforced idleness drags on, it's very easy to relax and let your guard down. The sense of danger is dulled, attention is weakened, and one day, lazily looking over the familiar seascape, you may not notice the thin needle of a mast appearing on the horizon. When in a few minutes you turn the periscope in that direction again, oh my God. It turns out that there is a huge ship coming at you, which has come quite close, and the masts, chimneys, superstructure, and even the people on deck are clearly visible. Jock was the first to spot the potential enemy through the periscope. It was the third day of the trip. After lunch, I was pacing in the wardroom. Suddenly I was awakened by a shout, Captain to post! In a flash, Wingfield was standing by the periscope. Number one and I moved closer so as not to miss anything. What's the matter, navigator? inquired the captain from Jock. I think it's the mast, sir. Ah, there it is, said the captain after a short pause. Good work, navigator. Here comes another one. Prepare to dive. The order was relayed to the forward and aft compartments, and the submarine came to life. People hurried along the aisles, hurrying to take their places. Number one took his post behind the horizontal rudder operators, watching the depth gauges. A few soft commands, and the trim disturbed by people running around the ship was restored. Being the third hand, during the attack I had to ensure the work of the computing device, in common parlance called fruit machina. 
but so far the captain was not going to attack, and I was able to watch him at the periscope. The excitement made me shiver. Not being able to see with my own eyes what was happening on the surface was literally driving me crazy. We were left to speculate, watching the expression on the captain's face. He was silent for a while. We thought he was trying to determine which ships we had encountered. Rays of light played in his eyes. Finally he turned the periscope knobs and ordered, Put the periscope away, starboard rudder 15, course 285. Turning to the chief mate, he explained, I think it's two minesweepers. They're checking the safety of the shipping lanes. There's no point in attacking. We'll only miss the opportunity to choose a better target. We'll get out of the way and keep watching. The tension in the control room eased immediately. The news of our encounter with the minesweepers spread quickly around the boat. We decided to lay low while they passed and slowly crept sideways at right angles to the direction of the enemy ships. The captain continued to keep watch for them and constantly took bearing and distances so that Jock could chart their course and speed. When they were out of sight we resumed our interrupted duty. Nothing more happened that day but our first encounter with the enemy made us feel that the unexpected might happen at any moment, so by nightfall everyone was alert. In a combat trip, the most dangerous thing for a submarine is the night surfacing. You have to wait until complete darkness, and to avoid accidental collision, you have to dive to great depths. For about half an hour we were completely blinded and went forward, relying only on hydrophones to hear the approaching danger. The air in the boat became heavy and breathing became difficult. The days are long in summer so we dived around four in the morning and surfaced after nine in the evening. And the lack of air and related discomfort was felt even at the end of a much shorter winter day. Visibility was poor at night, and after surfacing we still needed time for our lungs and blood to adapt to the fresh sea air again, only after which visual acuity was fully restored. Twenty minutes before surfacing, the order came. Lights out. The bright lights in the control room and forward compartments were extinguished, and instead barely visible dim bulbs were turned on so that the captain, watch officer and lookouts could adjust to the darkness. When a man looks in the dark, he uses a very different set of muscles than he does in the light. It takes at least 15 minutes for complete readjustment. Ordinary light produces the same effect on these muscles as touching a snail's horn. The preparation for surfacing takes place in semi-darkness, so that the scene looks somewhat ominous. Submariners consider the moment of surfacing to be the most dangerous. It is night above, we may have been detected by the destroyer, and are patiently waiting for us to appear on the surface next to it. So all the watchmen perform their duties with increased attention. The captain never leaves the control station for a minute. The acoustician listens to the sounds of the sea until his ears ache. After waiting for a report that everything is clear, the captain orders the surfacing to periscope depth and slowly surveys the surface of the water. Due to the lack of light, he cannot see anything, but hopes to guess the silhouette of danger if it is nearby. Besides, it would be the height of folly to surface if, for example, you spot a searchlight beam on the surface, but the captain sees nothing. Acoustic reports, no suspicious noises. Let's surface, decides the captain. The liaison gets up from his seat and opens the lower hatch cover of the combat deckhouse. Number one reports to the captain, Ready to surface, sir. Periscope down, the captain commands. Surfacing. He quickly heads for the gangway to the war room. The signalman follows and the lookouts are waiting at the gangway. We surface, accompanied by the whoosh of compressed air filling the ballast tanks. The captain swings open the top hatch. The air rushes noisily out of the boat, creating the effect of a small hurricane in the deckhouse, carrying with it the smells of fuel oil from the sewage and cabbage soup from the galley, where the cook had already begun preparing dinner. The lookouts followed the captain. We stopped blowing the tanks and waited for the first order. The boat rocked gently on the waves. Standing below, I lifted my head and peered through the open hatch. 
The sky was clear and I could clearly see a bright star bobbing in the frame of the top hatch. We moved slowly forward on electric motors. On the bridge, the captain and the lookouts were staring into the darkness. We couldn't start the diesels without making sure no one could hear us. Control station, came the captain's voice from the intercom. Control room here, answered the helmsman. Start main engines. It was clear that everything was all right up there. The engine telegraph tinkled, relaying orders to the engine room, and very soon the diesels came to life. A nice, fresh breeze blew through the rooms, blowing the remnants of sleep out of our sleepy brains. Smoking was forbidden while on the surface of the sea. Everyone extinguished their cigarettes. I went to the wardroom, hoping to get a hot supper and then go up to the bridge. The minesweepers met us almost every day. In low visibility, we used them as landmarks, and on the ninth day, they showed up with a large, heavily loaded barge. It was not a very good target, but in the absence of another, the captain decided to attack it to keep up morale. The plan was to fire two torpedoes. The order to attack made my heart beat faster. But outwardly calm, I walked over to my machine, turned it on, and prepared to input the initial data exactly as I had been taught. Game on. Raise the periscope. Bearing. Range. I'm on the target's starboard bow, heading ten degrees. The bearing and distance were reported by a petty officer standing behind the captain. I had to enter the raw data into the machine and get a response from it, which would help the captain to get into attack position and press the button to fire the torpedo at the right moment. Some of the figures I received were passed on to Jock, who charted them. He had before him a task of the utmost importance, to estimate the speed of the enemy. The attack progressed slowly. If we believe our calculations, the enemy ships were moving at a speed of six to eight knots. According to my calculations, the moment of attack was approaching. Now I had to get a guidance angle from the machine. In other words, the torpedo must come out at that moment and at such an angle that, given the speeds and directions of motion of the target and the torpedo itself, they are bound to meet. Fortunately, it was not a difficult attack, and when the captain asked, angle of guidance? Five, red, sir, I readily replied. First and second tubes to fire. Periscope up, periscope down, raise the periscope. Five, red, stand by. One down, two down. Clear the periscope. As the torpedoes came out of the bow tubes, I felt an increase in pressure on my eardrums. The boat shuddered as if it had suddenly hit something very big and soft. In tense silence, we waited for the explosions, mentally imagining torpedoes at forty knots heading for the victim. Meanwhile, the boat turned to the right, and the captain glanced through the periscope several times. Seconds seemed like hours. Alas, there were no explosions. Sorry, boys, I'm afraid we missed, said the clearly annoyed captain. Clearly annoyed. We were so disappointed that we don't even want to write about it. Besides, now we had to expect a retaliatory strike. Once again, looking through the periscope, the captain saw that the two minesweepers had changed course and were coming toward us. Apparently, they had spotted torpedo tracks in the water, and they didn't like it. Diving to 100 feet, number one. Prepare for bombardment. Maintain complete silence in the compartments. The depth gauge hand shuddered and crept up the scale. 40 feet, 50, 90... Here the horizontal rudder operators reduced the angle of the dive and at a depth of 100 feet levelled the boat. We waited again for the explosions, but now with a slightly different feeling. The acoustician reported hearing the noise of the propeller's aster and almost immediately the boat shuddered violently as if struck by a giant hammer. There was a frighteningly loud reverberating sound that I thought must have travelled across the ocean expanse of the entire planet. Much to my surprise, the lights didn't even blink. Not too close, said the captain. You call that not too close? Before he could say anything, the boat was shaken by another impact, accompanied by a rumble that disturbed the sea floor for miles around. But we had no damage. Weak contact, 160 degrees. Red, the acoustician reported. Searching with sonar. I think I hear his sonar, 
said the captain. As I listened, I also heard a faint sound, as if someone outside was tapping on the hull of the boat. Somehow it occurred to me that that was the same way Pew's stick from Treasure Island tapped on the walkway. It felt like you were locked in a dark room, and there was a blind maniac nearby, searching for you, reaching out his gnarled fingers. Perhaps the enemy had already heard our echo and was now approaching to kill. There were no more explosions, however, and my baptism of fire went easily enough. We spent another hour in tense anticipation, but nothing happened. The sonar waves were no longer hitting the hull of the boat, and the acoustician reported that the noise of the propellers was rapidly receding. Finally, the captain made the decision to surface to periscope depth and see what was going on up there. It was with great relief that we heard that the enemy ships were well astern and appeared to be moving away. We did not see them again until the end of the campaign, and three days later we received orders to return to base. We were warned that on the way back we could meet N-49, which would replace us, but we did not see anyone. On our return home we had another encounter with the enemy. We were approaching the Suffolk coast when suddenly a German fighter plane came out of the low floating clouds over our heads. I ordered an emergency dive, the lookouts quickly rolled down the gangway, but it was clear that the German had spotted us. The plane made a U-turn and came straight at us. I was already closing the hatch cover when bullets rattled on the deck. The German opened fire from machine guns. I closed the hatch and was in such a hurry to get to the control room that I couldn't hold on to the gangway and fell to the floor in a sack, scratching myself pretty badly. Machine gun bursts cannot damage the rugged hull of a boat, so we waited a while and continued home. In poor visibility, it took us some time to locate the waiting escort ship. We arrived safely at Hurrick, having had a chance to soak in a hot bath, eat fresh food, and enjoy the good feeling that we had returned safely from our first combat tour and had gained some serious experience. Half of the crew got short vacations. I was among the lucky ones. After going to London for four days, I returned to Harwick and began to prepare for the next campaign. We were to put to sea the day after the H-49 returned. On the day the H-49 was expected to approach, I went to headquarters to get the identification tables. In the room, besides me, was a staff officer who was acting strangely. I tried to talk to him several times but received unintelligible answers and realised that something serious had happened. Judging by his appearance, he hadn't even gone to bed the previous night. I innocently inquired when the H-49 was expected to arrive. After a long pause, he sighed and, without looking me in the eye, muttered that H-49 had not arrived at the rendezvous point with the escort ship and was not responding to radio calls. Of course, the possibility that the boat had been damaged and its radio equipment had malfunctioned could not be ruled out, but he concluded by saying that there was still hope and warned me to keep my mouth shut for the time being. By evening, it became clear that the irreparable had happened. All employees of the base and submariners from the H-28 was ordered to gather in the room of one of the coastal services. We were addressed by Captain Phillips, a recipient of the Order of Meritorious Service. This career sailor distinguished himself back in 1939 when, as commander of the submarine Ursula, sank the cruiser class Cologne, breaking through the guard of six destroyers. And it was in shallow water near the Elba estuary. Captain Phillips said the submarine H-49 was missing and presumed dead. This information from the mouth of a man who had recently been active and famous in the same waters was particularly significant. He also asked not to mention the loss of the boat outside the base, and said that he himself would break the sad news to the families of the submariners living in Harvick and the surrounding area. The captain then announced, to everyone's surprise, that the H-28's departure for sea would be postponed indefinitely, as an order from the Admiralty was pending that would decide our fate. He concluded by thanking us for our service and bidding us part. I felt truly sorry for this large and courageous man. Now he was facing a heavy and thankless task. Besides, the commander of the H-49 was his close friend. 
Jack and I went for a walk. We were both cold and scared. Thoughts of Durden, with whom we studied together, did not give us rest. He was so far away from us now that we didn't even want to think about it. I remembered the tired smile he'd greeted us with when he'd returned from his last trip. He had been the first of us to set out on his last voyage. Jock followed a little later, and less than a year later I was close to joining them. The next few days passed in an atmosphere of relaxation, but then came the order that all H-class submarines were to cease to go to sea and join the 7th Submarine Flotilla, manned only by training submarines and based at Rothesay in the Clyde Estuary. The submarine fleet base at Harwick was being dismantled. We packed up pretty quickly and headed out to sea. Our route was along the east coast around the north of Scotland towards the Clyde. In early December we arrived in Rothesay and moored aboard His Majesty's ship Cyclops, in peacetime, Rothesay was a popular summer resort, but now, in a beautiful bay with a wonderful panorama of Loch Straven and the blue hills of Argyll, a dirty old steamer, hastily converted into a very uncomfortable submarine base, smoked desperately. Only the shortage of ships, acutely felt in wartime, saved the old Cyclops from the fate of scrap metal. True, the submariners treated the old steamer with affection and called it our small car. Once a year, Cyclops went to sea, mainly to refute rumours that its bottom has long been resting on the bottom, or rather, on an artificial reef of empty tin cans. But in the intervals between these annual tests, the ship swayed quietly at anchor with the submarines moored on either side, like a hen with baby chickens. This peace was disturbed by the frequent squally winds that often came from the hills and turned the calm bay into a seething cauldron. Then the submarines had to withdraw to avoid damaging the mother hen. The seventh flotilla was created to fulfil the following functions. First, to train officers and lower ranks preparing for service in the submarine fleet, and second, to train destroyers and other escort ships. Therefore, many of the boats in this flotilla were dispersed to various bases where sea hunters were trained. We spent the winter months cruising back and forth along the west coast of Scotland. We spent time at Rothesay, Campbelltown, Ardrishow and Tobermory, working as a wind-up mouse for destroyer and corvette crews who were learning how to use sonar. Every morning we would go out to the exercise area with the surface ships, then dive to a depth of 80 feet and start moving on a predetermined course, while the ship's acoustics had to detect us and conduct a training attack. It was terribly boring. All the time off watch we mostly slept, but we were so used to the submarine that diving and surfacing operations were automatic. The crew was constantly changing, as is usually the case in training flotillas. By early February, I was one of four officers who led the H-28 in the last combat cruise. Jock was very soon transferred to an active submarine. After that, our paths crossed only once or twice, and then I heard that his submarine had not returned from a combat cruise. I was now acting as navigator. Our chief mate was also changed pretty quickly, and following him Wingfield took command of a new U-class boat called the Mediator. In his place came Lattell Bennington. Bennington had by then managed to earn the Distinguished Service Cross and had long been a senior mate on the submarine Triumph. One day Bennington was on watch when the boat, as usual, surfaced at night to recharge its batteries. The case took place at Skagerrak. Standing on the bridge, he suddenly saw a horned mine on the crest of a surging wave. It was too late to do anything but protect his face. There was a tremendous explosion, and at first Bennington thought the boat was finished. But to his surprise, the submarine remained on the surface of the sea. An examination of the damage showed that the bow of the sturdy hull had been turned around for 18 feet, and the forward bulkhead had somehow miraculously held together although cracks had appeared in it. The torpedoes had not detonated, but one had been blown off with its tube, another had only its tail section, and the third had a damaged warhead. A ten-foot vertical crack appeared in the middle section of the ship's solid hull, and ten yards from the epicentre of the explosion, a sailor was found continuing to sleep peacefully in his hammock. On the whole, the condition of the boat was quite deplorable. She could not dive, 
and constantly running pumps could barely cope with pumping out the water coming in through the numerous cracks and holes. Captain Triumph J. McCoy radioed for help, after which the crippled submarine moved home in the North Sea. The next morning the boat was spotted by a German plane, but did not have time to attack as destroyers and air escort came to the rescue. Late at night the Triumph entered the Firth of Forth. Beshgangton was a stocky guy of small stature, had a blonde hair, ruddy face and ineradicable faith in the superiority of the submarine fleet over all other branches of the military. He could talk about submarines for hours. They were his religion. He always respectfully referred to submarines as submarines. He didn't even seem to be interested in women. When he went ashore, he would settle down at the nearest diner, have a long beer, and keep talking about submarines. It was especially hard to talk to him in the morning. When we went to sea, he would always lie on his bunk, smoking cigarettes one after another and drinking tea, cup after cup. But when the shore was left behind, he invariably appeared on the bridge and began to give orders clearly. I never once saw the man eat breakfast. He was an excellent teacher. I learned a great deal from him, which served me well when I took command of my own submarine. We got along very well, but in April, exactly six months after my first appearance aboard the H-28, I received orders to report to Chatham. Wingfield offered me the position of third mate on the Mediator. Dock trials on the Mediator had been successfully completed, and among them was a dive to test the water tightness of the rugged hull. And now everything that indicated construction work was removed from the rooms, new bunks, tables, lockers were installed, new curtains were hung in the wardroom and dining room of the crew. The boat smelled of fresh paint, it was painted white inside and dark grey outside. Mervyn Wingfield was very pleased with the new crew, though he tried to hide it under a mask of imperturbability and strictness. The senior assistant was Peter Bannister, whom I had never met before. He was a tall and very energetic man with a sense of humour that made him easy to talk to. The navigator, Tony Godden, had studied with me at Fort Blockhouse. I was very glad we got on the same boat because he was a very nice and pleasant person. During our stay in Chatham we often spent time together ashore. At the end of July, Mediator finally entered the River Medway and set a course north to the Clyde, where she was to undergo sea trials as well as training manoeuvres with the 3rd Flotilla based at Danoon. After that, we were to have a trial run in the North Sea, and then we were to sail to the Mediterranean. We stopped at Sherness for the night to await a convoy of merchant ships leaving the Thames the next day. In the morning we found the convoy formed with an escort of gunboats and admiralty trawlers and took our place as trailing. All day we moved along the east coast in the vicinity of Olderberg. A German bomber appeared in the sky and began to attack the lead ships of the convoy. I was on watch at the time and, in accordance with instructions, ordered us to dive. We had never dived at sea on the move before. Usually a new submarine performs numerous training dives at low speed before proceeding to full speed dives. We had to perform our first dive on the Howler signal, and it was a success. This was due to the Chatham shipbuilders, Captain Wingfield, who trained his officers well, Chief Mate Bannister, who managed to ensure that each crew member knew their duties. Within two minutes, Bannister had the boat levelled, and the captain was able to concentrate on watching. It was very important for us not to stay underwater longer than necessary, because the convoy could have gotten far ahead. After five minutes the Heinkel disappeared, we surfaced and increased our speed to catch up with the convoy, which was unaffected by the attack. We were very pleased and boyishly proud of the boat, which behaved impeccably and did not fail at the crucial moment. By nightfall, however, one of the diesels developed a fault and had to be shut down. At first, this did not affect our speed as our propulsion system was diesel-electric and we took our place in the convoy order. By late afternoon, it became apparent that the mechanics could not fix the failure and start the engine. One diesel was not producing enough power to turn both propellers and compensate for the loss of battery power, so we had to reduce speed. 
We reported the matter to the convoy commodore. A special boat was assigned to escort us. We were ordered to take all measures to join the convoy as soon as possible. We knew from radio reports that 20 miles to the north, there was another convoy moving toward us toward the buoyed shipping channel. About midnight, the two convoys were to meet. According to current international rules, in narrow places, ships must keep to starboard and diverge to port. It was later found that when the convoys met, we were a few miles behind and they had parted to starboard. So when the watch officer, Tony Godden, reported that the oncoming convoy was approaching, Captain Wingfield going up on the bridge was surprised to find that it was not on our left course, as expected, but directly ahead of us, with some of the vessels even being on our starboard side. The night was quiet and very dark, but the visibility was quite satisfactory, so that the ship's lights could be seen from quite a distance. But it was well known that enemy U-boats often appeared in these places, so the ships went without lights. The boat accompanying us was lost. We were alone and almost invisible to passing ships, even if they were at a short distance. In a normal situation, we would have done a simple thing. We changed course and went sharply to the right. But there were oncoming merchant ships approaching us from the right, and there was a good chance that we would not be able to pass them in time. Wingfield changed course, and we turned a few degrees to the left. The first six vessels of the convoy passed us safely about 200 yards to starboard. We did not know then that our convoy, several miles ahead, had performed the same manoeuvre. Suddenly a dark silhouette appeared in front of us, detached from the nearest convoy column. Wingfield, who never lowered his binoculars for a moment, saw that it was a trawler, probably part of the escort, and that we were on its course. The next second the captain realised that the trawler was very close by, and apparently the lookouts on it could not see the boat. He had to decide very quickly what to do as the trawler was about to pass dangerously close. Under the rules in force we were obliged to give way. The same regulations required Wingfield to turn to the right, but only 200 yards to our right there was an endless column of merchant ships in the oncoming convoy, presenting us with an insurmountable barrier. The authors of the rules for preventing collisions at sea had somehow failed to make provision for ships travelling at night without lights. Wingfield finally made up his mind and ordered, put the rudder to the left. But as soon as we started to turn, the trawler spotted us. Seeing something large, low and dark in the water ahead of him, the trawler's captain apparently instinctively turned to the right. As a result, a collision became inevitable. The last thing Wingfield had time to shout into the intercom was the order, Full astern! But before it could be executed, the trawler's bow slammed into the starboard side of our boat. There was a terrible impact, accompanied by the sickening crack of crumpling metal. For a few seconds, the two ships seemed to be caught in a deadly embrace. Wingfield, barely able to stand on his feet, pounded his fist in despair on the trawler's overhanging side and shouted, Bastard! You've sunk a British submarine! Then the trawler jerked back and Wingfield felt the deck fall away from under his feet. Hardly more than thirty seconds had passed, and the captain, Tony Godden, and the two lookouts were already floundering in the water. At first, all four tried to keep together. One by one, the lookouts were the first to give up. After a while, Tony Godden said he could not get rid of the high boots that were pulling him down. The captain helped him as much as he could to keep afloat, but his strength was not unlimited. When the lifeboat from the trawler appeared, the sailors found only Captain Wingfield on the water, who was unconscious. He was hoisted aboard. One need not have too developed an imagination to imagine the feelings he experienced when he woke up and realised that he was probably the only survivor of the entire crew. When the captain, having received Tony's message about the approaching convoy, came up to the bridge, Peter Bannister and I were sitting in the wardroom at the table deciphering the message the radio operator had given us. The wardroom was separated from the control room by a thin steel partition and from the passageway by a plain curtain. The curtains were never drawn at sea, so we could hear the helmsman repeating the commands received from the bridge from the captain. When we heard the order, Put the helm to the left, 
we jumped up and glanced anxiously at each other. Running out into the passageway, Peter immediately ordered the watertight doors closed. Almost immediately we heard the captain's last command over the intercom, and before the helmsman could repeat it, there was a bang that struck the reserve torpedo compartment in the bow of the boat. It was accompanied by a blue-white flash and a muffled explosion. The boat sharply tumbled to the left side and, after hesitating for a few seconds, began to sink. We were well aware that if the depths here were great, the hull of the boat would soon be crushed by the multi-ton masses of water like eggshells. The lights went out, people from the neighbouring compartment ran past us. Close the door! Peter shouted to me. Although my hand was on the door, I didn't obey immediately, letting the men through. How could I deny them a chance to escape, especially since the door to the damaged compartment was closed? Whether it had been slammed shut by the explosion, or whether one of the sailors had sacrificed his life and closed it from the inside, we never knew the truth. Shut the damn door, Peter roared. By this time the men from the next compartment had passed, and I closed the door with difficulty, for the boat had a great roll. Then I hurried down the heavily tilted deck to the control room. The boat had gained trim and was now sinking to the bottom at an angle of about ten degrees. Water seemed to be coming from everywhere. Peter was trying to close the battery vent valve, at the same time trying to find out where the water was coming from, and clearly realising that if the water got to the batteries below deck, the boat's rooms would fill with caustic gas and it would be all over. I rushed to his aid, glad that I could do something useful, but it was already done. We looked around, trying to see a possible gap in our defences. My brain seemed to be paralysed with fear. I imagined that the impact had turned the hull of the boat all the way around, and it was a wonder that no water was pouring down from above. Evidently, the top hatch had slammed shut on impact. In the darkness, I could hear Peter's voice demanding that the lights be set up. Everyone was busy looking for flashlights. I remembered that I had a flashlight somewhere too, and walked along the wet and sloping deck, trying to figure out where it was. The water was already knee-deep in the passageway. I struggled to get into the wardroom. The whole place was flooded with water. The icy jets flowed from somewhere above, turning the beautiful new curtains into rags and breaking the furniture. Unfortunately, I lacked knowledge at the time, and I had no idea where the waterfall was coming from, so I couldn't do anything about it. It was only when it was over that I realised that the water was coming in through the ventilation shaft, which was flooded due to damage to the reserve torpedo bay. I could have simply reached over to the vent located on the bulkhead above the captain's seat and closed it, thus shutting off the waterfall. But the disaster had put me in a stupor, and I was unable to think clearly or make constructive decisions. I found a flashlight and returned to the control post, lighting my way. On the way, I became very curious about the depth we were at. I pointed the flashlight beam at the depth gauges and was surprised to find that both were reading just over 60 feet. This meant that we were in shallow water. Most likely the boat had jammed its nose into the bottom at 80 feet deep. I asked Peter if we could blow out all the tanks and resurface. This seemed unlikely, as we were on the surface at the time of the collision meaning we had maximum buoyancy. If the boat went down so quickly, it meant that too much water had entered the forward compartments. It was clear that there was an impressive hole in the solid hull and the compartment was flooded within seconds. We would never be able to bring a boat full of water to the surface. True, Peter decided that it would do no harm to try in any case. So he opened one by one the valves regulating the compressed air supply to the tanks. We blew five ballast tanks and two main internal tanks, but it had no effect. The depth gauges didn't even flicker. Water continued to flow into the interior, making horrible noises. Its level was gradually rising. Soon the water reached the electrical wires on the starboard side, and the darkness began to light up with bright flashes. I thought that we would all be electrocuted very soon. There were human figures scurrying about the rooms, but in the semi-darkness it was impossible to make out who was who. There was no panic, but I think people were in a stupor as I was. 
I noticed that a man was trying to open the door in the watertight bulkhead that I had closed shortly before. My friend is in there, he said dully. My friend is staying in there. You can't help him, I said. The forward compartments are flooded. There's no survivors. The boy stepped back, sobbing. Stepped back. Somehow it seemed very important for us to find as many lanterns as possible. I knew there were probably a few more in the wardroom, so I decided to make another foray. There was already waist-deep water. Shivering with cold and fear, I rummaged through every available closet and locker for flashlights. Any personal belongings I could find, underwear, razors, pipes, photographs, I ruthlessly tossed aside. Unfortunately, after a long search, I managed to find only one dry and working lantern, which I proudly carried to the control station, raising it high above the water. When I returned to the post, no one was there. The door to the engine room was closed. Had I been in the wardroom too long, and everyone had gotten out through the engine room escape hatch without noticing I was gone? Even if people haven't left the submarine yet, they may well have started flooding the compartment to prepare to get out of the boat, and if the flooding continued long enough, it would be impossible to open that door. I listened but heard nothing but the monotonous sound of flowing water. In that eerie moment, I was very close to panic, but I could at least try to make myself known, and that meant knocking something heavy on the door. As I looked around, I spotted the wrench, grabbed it, and raced toward the closed door with as much speed as I could muster. And that's when I heard a voice right next to me. Good God, who's there? I looked up and realised that I was standing under the war room, and Peter was peering out of the hatch. From the sounds coming from there, there were several other people with him. Where did you come from? he exclaimed. Where did everyone go? I asked. Do you have room for me in there? We'll squeeze in somehow. The rest of us will try to get out through the engine room. I flew up the gangway and squeezed through the hatch, terribly pleased that I was not alone. There were four of us. Peter was hanging on the top steps of the gangway with his head against the top hatch, one of the mechanics below and me and the electrician below. The electrician was very ill, vomiting all the time he could hardly stand. There was a small opening in the centre of the top hatch, a round window covered with thick glass designed for high water pressure. Peter said he could see a spot of light through it and thought some surface ship was shining a searchlight on the surface. This encouraged us. Maybe we could swim to the surface. We knew that the depth gauges in the control room showed 60 feet, the upper hatch of the deck house was about 15 feet above the water line, so we were about 45 feet from rescue the height of eight men standing on each other's heads. Nonsense, Peter ordered the lower hatch cover closed, which I did not hesitate to do, and we began to discuss a plan of action. One obvious danger was that on the way up we might smash our heads on the crossbeam between the periscope racks, but the likelihood of this was thought to be small because of the severe starboard roll. We hoped that we would be helped up to the surface by an air bubble that would appear from the fighting deck house when we opened the hatch. As a matter of fact, the task was not difficult. Peter would open the hatch, and when the water began to flow into the cabin, we would each take in as much air as we could and swim upward as fast as we could. We were quite calm except for the unfortunate electrician, who was feeling worse by the minute. I don't remember how much time we spent discussing it, but then Peter said, now it remains to be seen if we can open the hatch. There's a lot of water pressure at this depth. He pushed the hatch cover as hard as he could, but it remained immobile. Somehow we had to increase the pressure in the tower. It occurred to me that while we were talking down below in the control room, the pressure was being increased by the constant inflow of seawater. I lifted the lower hatch and the air rushed into the turret with a whoosh. A few minutes later I smelled a pungent, unpleasant odour. It might have been the smell of fear, but I immediately decided that the seawater had gotten to the batteries after all. Oh, I think I smell chlorine. Okay, Peter said quickly. Then close your lid and I'll try again. This time he managed to lift the lid slightly. A thin stream of water trickled through the gap. All right, boys, said Peter. 
but let's take our time. Let me know when you're ready. I said we should get out as soon as possible, before we got too weak from breathing the poisoned air. No one objected. We stripped down, leaving only our underwear and socks on. Ready? Peter asked. Ready, we answered in unison. I think the poor electrician was in such a state that all he wanted to do was die. Then get ready, said Peter cheerfully. Let's go, and he opened the hatch cover. I took a deep breath, and at the same moment a torrent of water washed over us. It was pitch black and my ears were thundering, but I had to fight for my life. I began to scramble up the stairs, but soon my head hit something soft. It turned out to be the butt of a sailor stuck in the hatch. With the desperation of a man with nothing left to lose, I tried to push him out of the hatch. He jerked several times and tapped me in the face with his heel. I gave him another hard push, and we both fell out of the hatch. I swam quickly upward. The distance seemed completely insurmountable. At the moment when I realised that my lungs could not take it any more and would explode, it suddenly became clear that my head was already out of the water and I could breathe. I coughed, sneezed and spit for a long time, but I enjoyed breathing in the sweet sea air, revelling in the sight of the stars and the dark night sky. The sea was calm, the surface of the water rippled slightly from the light ripples. As I looked closer, I saw two people swimming nearby and called out to them. It was Peter and the sailor I had pushed out of the boat, both in good health. The unfortunate electrician was nowhere to be seen. We noticed the silhouettes of vessels around us and started shouting, trying to attract attention. Some of them were illuminating the dark surface of the water with searchlights. It seemed to me that one vessel was closer to us than the others. Let's sail to it, I suggested, and immediately put my intention into action. Somehow I had no doubt that my companions would follow me. I swam for a few minutes, and then I found that there was no one following me. I heard the voices of my companions in the distance, but did not see them. The vessel to which I was headed was much farther away than I had at first thought. I am not a very good swimmer, so soon enough I turned over on my back, as it was much easier to swim, and began to call for help. Occasionally a wave would slam into me, so I swallowed a lot of water. I swam for a long time, but the ship did not approach. Was I destined to perish when rescue was at hand? I felt that my strength was rapidly leaving me. Suddenly I heard voices very close by, and a searchlight struck me squarely in the eye. When I turned my head, I saw a boat approaching, with a net hanging from its side. I could even see people scurrying around on the deck. Immediately the end of the rope slipped into the water beside me, and I clutched at it with a deadly grip and was soon on board. I was exhausted and could hardly speak, only breathe heavily and noisily. I was wrapped in a blanket and led downstairs. When I regained the power of intelligible speech, the first thing I said was that there were several people still floating in the water, and besides there were people left in the boat. Evidently something was preventing them from getting out through the engine room. In the cabin I was helped to undress and laid on a bunk, where I remained, shivering with delayed shock. Half an hour later May was told that people were beginning to get out of the boat. I could not remain in ignorance any longer, and wrapped myself in a blanket and dragged myself on deck. People came to the surface at regular intervals, all covered with black oil that had coated the surface of the water after the engine room had flooded. They had Davis's life preservers and oxygen tanks with them. They were extremely excited, having come back to life when many had already given up hope. All were grateful to the XO and torpedo officer who had organised the men's exit from the boat. There were enough life preservers for all but two men. Two sailors volunteered to get out of the boat without them. They had to hold on to the legs of one of the life preservers. One of the daredevils drowned. After a roll call, it turned out that there was another victim in the engine room crew of 20, a civilian engineer from the Chatham shipyard who was on the boat as a passenger. He urgently needed to get north. The man was given a life preserver and explained how to use it. However, the disaster made such an impression on him that he lost control of himself, and although he managed to get out of the boat, he never made it to the surface. 
But in general, the operation of rescuing people from the machine plexus was carried out at the highest level. Much later, I learned that in the midst of the rescue operation, the senior mechanic decided to make sure that there was no one left in the boat. He personally went around all available non-flooded rooms, carefully inspected the nooks and crannies of the engine room, and then continued to monitor the exit of people from the boat. He himself was the last to leave the submarine. Later, for this operation, senior mechanic Killen was awarded a medal. It was only when my boat docked at Yarmouth that it became clear that Peter Bannister was not among those rescued. I was told that several of the men had been picked up by another ship, and I was reassured to think that Peter and the sailor who had been with him all the time were there. Later, it turned out that the sailor had indeed been picked up, and he told me that he had been sailing with Peter for a long time, and when they were pulled out of the water he had no doubt that Peter was there. But at the last moment he disappeared somewhere, and long searches led nowhere. The news of Peter's death shocked me. He was an excellent swimmer, and when we swam side by side he seemed full of energy. He had overcome so many difficulties and deed at the very end, when rescue was very near. At Yarmouth we arrived in the middle of the afternoon, we were met on the quay by Lieutenant Commander Brown, who had flown in from Submarine Fleet Headquarters in London to ascertain the details of the accident on the spot. The rest of the day was spent answering endless questions and in between enjoying the hospitality of the naval base staff. In the evening I went out for a little walk. It was drizzling rain, and at another time I would have found the weather quite unsuitable for a walk but now the soft rustle of raindrops falling on the grass seemed to me sweet and sad music. Life seemed delightfully beautiful to me, and I vowed to appreciate it in all its manifestations and never to express dissatisfaction. Thus I felt for the first time what a joy it was to be alive. At the same time, I realised that in extreme circumstances, I acted quite differently than a real submarine officer should have acted. Again and again, I went over in my memory all the events that followed the collision, thought about what I should have done. I was tormented by two thoughts. The first was how I hadn't been smart enough to realise that the water was coming into the control room through the ventilation system. The second was that I should have gone into the engine room with the others. I had to think about the future. At first I decided that I would never go near a submarine in my life. But over time I realised that if I wrote a report about leaving the submarine fleet, I would admit my total defeat and could no longer respect myself. So I decided to stay, if, of course, I am allowed. Remembering that the horse that threw you off should be immediately saddled again. I decided to ask to be sent on a combat tour as soon as possible. In this mood I was caught by Wingfield. He came to me shortly before midnight, as he had remained at the scene of the collision until the last minute. I thought he had aged ten years, for he looked so glum and haggard. He told me about Tony Godden's death and asked about Peter. I told him everything I knew. The captain said that we had lost half the crew. The total number of dead was twenty-two, of whom two were officers. The next day we answered a number of more questions, after which we were given two weeks' leave, in the middle of which we were called before the Board of Inquiry at Chatham. And I reported to the Dolphin at Gosport at the end of my leave, and, in response to my request to return to sea, was ordered to succeed Freddie Sherwood as torpedo officer of the submarine Sea Lion, based at Fort Blockhouse and operating off the coast of France. Her commanding officer was the notoriously bearded Ben Briand. 